This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Yeah, that mescaline. Wow. That's strange stuff. This is a disaster. I think it's awesome. But full disclosure, I just drank ayahuasca. The hell is ayahuasca? What's in that tea? Psilocybin? LSD? It's just tea. Let's talk about LSD. Uh, children, LSD is bad. I have eaten some mushrooms. Magic mushrooms? I am hallucinating. Okay. So I've been Googling what the internet says about magic mushrooms. The DEA says that magic mushrooms are abused by ingesting them orally, and the psychological consequences of psilocybin use include hallucinations and an inability to discern fantasy from reality. Panic reactions and a psychotic-like episode may also occur, particularly if a user ingests a high dose. Effects of overdose include longer, more intense trip episodes, psychosis, and possible death. So the DEA thinks these are pretty dangerous. Wikipedia, on the other hand, says that sensory effects include visual and auditory hallucinations, followed by emotional changes and altered perception of time and space. These shifts in perception visually include enhancement and contrasting of colors, strange light phenomena, such as auras or halos around light sources. Surfaces that seem to ripple, shimmer, or breathe. Sounds may seem to have increased clarity, and some users experience synesthesia, wherein they perceive, for example, a visualization of color upon hearing a particular sound. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. This is your brain on drugs. Well, specifically psychedelics, and more specifically serotonergic psychedelics, which include substances like DMT, mescaline, and of course, psilocybin or magic mushrooms. Some of you psychonauts out there might be saying, oh hey, don't forget about LSD. Don't worry, I didn't. LSD also falls into this category, but it has effects on dopamine signaling as well, so it's sort of a special example here. All of these drugs can cause euphoria, giddiness, paranoia, fear, and they can have a dramatic impact on cognition and perception, including causing a distorted sense of time, altered perception of color and sounds, hallucinations, and profoundly spiritual experiences. Some people even report meeting God, and for some, particular trips rank as being among the most meaningful experiences of their lives. Micah recently did a video about how mental health professionals are now using illicit drugs to treat psychiatric conditions such as PTSD, depression, and even addiction. And in general, there's been a lot of press lately about how these dangerous controlled substances are proving to be incredibly effective medicines. To learn more about how the US government decides which drugs need to be controlled and how they're being used in a therapy setting, check out Micah's video, link in the description and also up there. It's super exciting that there are more scientists and physicians exploring the potential of these drugs for treating mental illnesses. Because treating mental illness is, in general, very hard. The brain is a big, squishy, complex organ and we don't understand it all that well. We've got a handful of antipsychotics, a couple different kinds of antidepressants, and in very severe cases, electroconvulsive shock therapy. So doctors and scientists are pretty desperate for new drugs that can help people who aren't seeing results with what's already on the market. But how is it that these drugs are proving to be so effective? And why is it that substances we usually think of as, at best, party drugs, and at worst, dangerous, addictive substances, can be so healing for our brains. Well, to be totally honest, because of the challenges of studying these drugs, thanks a bunch FDA, and because neurochemistry is hard, we're not 100% sure we know exactly what's going on, but we do have some ideas. Let's get back to our main example, psilocybin. Psilocybin is the active ingredient in most so-called magic mushrooms, which might make you think of tripped out hippies and Burning Man. The truth is, the history of psilocybin goes back thousands of years. Rock paintings in Australia indicate that magic mushrooms may have been consumed there as early as 10,000 BC. And honestly, it's pretty likely we've been tripping for the entire time our species has existed. 
Other animals are known to seek out and eat plants with psychedelic effects. And there's even a fringe theory called the stoned ape hypothesis that says that humans became conscious because we opened our minds using psychedelics. But we're not gonna get into that because it's actually a pretty bad theory. More recently, psychedelic mushrooms have long been used by the indigenous people of Mesoamerica for religious ceremonies. In fact, the name for magic mushrooms in Nahuatl is Teonanacatal, which literally translates to flesh of the gods. The term magic mushrooms comes from a 1957 article in Life magazine called Seeking the Magic Mushroom, written by amateur mycologist R. Gordon Wasson, who described his experience participating in a mushroom ceremony guided by the shaman Maria Sabina. The story attracted the attention of others interested in psychedelic compounds, and psilocybin quickly joined the ranks of psychedelics that began to proliferate within the counterculture community. Similarly, DMT is derived from plant sources, and mescaline is found in cacti in Mexico and the Andes region of South America. Both have long been used for religious and spiritual ceremonies among the indigenous people of the regions in which they're found. So, Psychedelics are nothing new, and in many cultures, they've been revered for thousands of years. But as Micah described, thanks to a lot of fear-mongering and, honestly, racism, most of these drugs have been painted as dangerous and or addictive. And basically all of them are illegal in the U.S. outside of very specific circumstances. Blah, 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 I hear you saying. I know, you want me to get to the good stuff, the science. But the context is important here, because when we think about the effects of different substances, it's important to consider where they come from, how they've been used in the past, and the real risks and benefits of their use. Not just the assumptions we have because of pop culture and propaganda. But since I'm such a kind host, I guess we can talk about what it does to your brain. The effects of serotonergic psychedelics may feel somewhat obvious. I mean, serotonin is right there in the name. Serotonin, if you're not familiar with it, is a monoamine that acts as a neurotransmitter, but is also found throughout the body. Our bodies make serotonin from tryptophan. Yes, that infamous amino acid that supposedly puts you to sleep after a big turkey dinner. The majority of serotonin, over 90%, is actually found in our digestive system, where it plays a big role in digestion, and in particular in gut motility, which is basically how your intestines keep it all moving along. Only around 2% of your serotonin is actually found in the central nervous system, where it's produced primarily by neurons in the raphe nuclei in the brainstem that project different areas all around the brain. Serotonin has direct effects on the neurons it binds to, and it also modulates the effects of other neurotransmitters like dopamine and norepinephrine. Many people are familiar with serotonin because of its association with mood and well-being. It also plays a role in cognition and psychosis, but really, its effects are not that well understood. We do know that low levels of serotonin are associated with obsessive compulsive disorder, and that its levels fluctuate during social interactions. A long-held hypothesis about depression is that it's a result of low levels of serotonin in the brain, but that theory is losing ground in light of more recent evidence showing that depression may be more related to changes in brain structure and inflammation markers. Still, there's enough evidence for its role in mood that it's one of the primary targets for antidepressant medications. Old school antidepressants known as MAOIs, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors, boost serotonin and dopamine levels in the brain by blocking monoamine oxidase, which prevents the enzyme from breaking down these neurotransmitters so they can linger in the synapse longer. These days, SSRIs or SNRIs, selective serotonin or selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, are much more popular as they have fewer side effects. These drugs are thought to work by preventing neurons from reabsorbing serotonin and or norepinephrine after it's been released into the synapse, which leaves more of those good, good neurotransmitters floating around so they can continue to have a downstream effect on signaling. Taken together, this basically means that when you boost the level of serotonin signaling in the brain, in general, you typically see improvements in mood. But on the flip side, too much free serotonin in the body, whether due to the use of prescription medications or other substances, 
can lead to serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome can be relatively mild, causing agitation and gastrointestinal disturbances and issues with muscle rigidity and twitching. But sometimes it can be life-threatening as it can lead to high fevers and seizures when things really get out of control. So lots of serotonin activity is good, especially when it comes to improving mood and too much serotonin is bad. To some degree, all serotonergic psychedelics show affinity for various serotonin receptors, of which there are several. With magic mushrooms, the active ingredient psilocybin gets metabolized into psilocin, which is a tryptamine alkaloid that resembles serotonin in its structure, so it can bind to those serotonin receptors. In fact, most of these psychedelics are tryptamines that mimic the structure of serotonin. Many of them have strong effects on a particular kind of receptor known as 5-HTA2 which, interestingly, is also an important receptor for the actions of antipsychotic medications. And genetic variants affecting this particular receptor have been connected to schizophrenia. But it's not just serotonin that's affected by most of these drugs. As I said, serotonin modulates other neurotransmitters, including dopamine, which is a phenylethylamine, just another type of organic compound that's shaped differently than the tryptamines. Some psychedelics, like mescaline and members of the 2C family, are also phenylethylamines, and LSD in particular is believed to have significant effects on dopaminergic signaling. All of these substances vary in their structure and therefore in how well they bind to various receptors in the brain, and there are differences in their effects. What's more, some of these drugs, especially if they're being consumed in a natural form, like eating a mushroom, may be affected by trace amounts of other compounds in whatever you're eating. When you consider the fact that many of these psychedelic drugs act on the same types of receptors and neurotransmitters that are affected by traditional antidepressants and antipsychotics, it's less surprising that these drugs might seem to represent some interesting opportunities for new medical treatments. This has been a major motivation for exploring topics like the use of LSD for treating anxiety and psilocybin for helping people with serious illnesses like cancer cope with their diagnosis. It makes sense that we'd want to leverage substances we know can affect the neural circuits associated with mood. But then there's the whole tripping balls part of the experience. We're pretty sure that many of the trippy effects of these drugs are due to their interaction with a 5-HT2A receptor. You know, the effects like time distortion, hallucinations, out-of-body experiences, and paranoia. We're not really clear on how drug plus brain equals perceptual differences, but if I had to guess, it would be that it probably has to do with the fact that these substances cause changes in brain activity that result in all kinds of interesting new signaling patterns it normally never sees. That probably leads to some crossed wires where certain circuits that respond to things like patterns and colors are activated or enhanced because of the drug, creating some of those stereotypical psychedelic effects. But these effects are probably at least somewhat related to dose. After all, plenty of bros in Silicon Valley microdose with LSD, and they don't have full-blown trips every time. Instead, they report that the drugs boost their creativity, improve their interpersonal interactions, actions and make them less stressed without having a significant impact on their cognition. And lots of the work being done on using these drugs for treating mental illnesses is focused on finding a sweet spot between having a positive effect on mood while not leading to a full-blown trip. Some researchers are even trying to develop new drugs that can give you that mood boost without the high. This would be especially helpful in cases where people are needing regular repeated treatment for severe mental illnesses, especially in cases where traditional treatments don't seem to work. It probably wouldn't be as helpful as a medication if you spent hours every day flying to the moon and talking to gods. One thing that's cool about using these psychedelics as medicine is that often the positive effects are almost immediate, like patients report feeling better pretty much as soon as they've finished the trip. Compared to the four to six weeks it takes for traditional SSRI antidepressants to kick in, that is a pretty big game changer. And it's especially important in situations where someone really needs help fast, like if they're struggling with suicidal ideation. But as Micah discussed, one big challenge to studying these drugs and to using them in medical settings is the FDA's scheduling system, which has listed many of these substances as being very dangerous and having no medical benefit. 
Now, we know that the second point isn't true, but what about the first one? Are they dangerous? The short answer is, not really. The long answer is, not really, and especially not when you compare them to readily available substances like alcohol and nicotine. Let's take psilocybin as an example. The median lethal dose, meaning the dose that would kill around half of a given test population, is 280 milligrams per kilogram, which is one and a half times greater than that of caffeine. You would need to eat almost 40 pounds of fresh magic mushrooms to reach that dose. It is vanishingly rare for people to die from an overdose on psilocybin. Only a couple of cases have ever been reported, and in most of them, it's impossible to rule out other potential causes of death. Similarly, only a handful of people have ever overdosed on LSD, leading to comas, and there haven't been any documented cases of LSD causing death. According to the US DEA, so take it with a little grain of salt, at high doses, DMT can cause seizures and can lead to a coma. And of course, like anything that affects serotonergic signaling, there's a risk of serotonin syndrome if things get too crazy, especially if you mix these substances with things like traditional antidepressants. With pretty much all of these, as with so many substances, the dose makes the poison, at least when it comes to the directly harmful effects of the drugs. There are some other risks, of course. Bad trips are not fun experiences, and people can end up having panic attacks or behaving dangerously while they're high. This can result in people being a risk to themselves and to others. Plus, just like having a good trip can be good for one's mental health, it's possible that a bad trip could lead to worsened mental health symptoms after the fact, especially if the substances are used without a physician's supervision. Also, users might mix substances, adding in other drugs that can be more dangerous, especially when used in combination. Think drugs like MDMA or alcohol. Some people can experience psychosis-like symptoms when using psychedelics, though in most cases they will recover fully. And people can also experience flashbacks after the fact, which can be unsettling. That said, while tolerance can build up quickly with frequent use, basically none of these drugs are thought to be physically addictive. So I am 100% not saying that you should run out and start doing psychedelic drugs. There are definitely risks to their use. But considering the legality and regular social use of other much more addictive and deadly substances like alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine, it does seem a little weird to me that psychedelics are stereotyped as being so dangerous in our society. I think my grandma said it best when she said that it's the fear of the unknown. We know so little about these substances that they scare us and keep us from wanting to learn more. But even that might be changing. Some states are moving to decriminalize drugs like psilocybin. And while researching for this video, I got a ton of ads for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which to me indicates a growing shift in how these drugs are being perceived. These substances have a history of being used for profound and meaningful spiritual experiences. And now in Western medicine, they are again being appreciated for their potential to help individuals grapple with difficult mental states. Like any treatment, there are risks, but they don't necessarily outweigh the benefits. And I'm happy to see so many new research studies and therapeutic opportunities popping up. If you wanna learn more about some of these drugs and their effects, and how these different neurotransmitters in your brain interact to affect your mood and cognition, you should totally buy our book, Brains Explained. And if you buy it today, you don't even have to wait because it's out now. You can even get it on Kindle if you really want that instant gratification. Check out the links in the description to order a copy. Or better yet, call your local bookstore or library and ask if they might order a copy for you. So, did you learn anything new about psychedelics today? Got a personal experience to share? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions. Until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrocyte. Over and out.